Again, this morning we'll start a new series on the Beatitudes. It's in Matthew 5, verses 3 through 12. We'll look at one a week and take us right up to Easter. So that's where we'll be. So you know when you when you show up, you're going to hear about one of the Beatitudes. Because it's part of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Most English versions... I looked up the, the English Standard, the King James, the New American Standard, the NIV, the New King James, and the Revised Standard, all worded as, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The New Living, which I, I, like, to, I like to use, words it as, as the following, God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for Him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. It kind of already puts the, the meaning into the, into the text. Of course, all the Beatitudes, you know, it starts off with, blessed are somebody, and then what, their, what, what they'll receive, what their reward is, what they'll obtain. Blessed, we'll start off with, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed can, can mean, of course, Blessed or fortunate, or they're in a position of favor, or happy because you're getting something that God has promised. So you can look at it as fortunate are the poor in spirit, happy are the poor in spirit, because they're going to obtain something. Of course, in, in that culture, you're considered blessed if you were healthy and or wealthy. If your life was a good life, people looked at you as you were blessed, you were fortunate. God's favor was upon you. And then the flip side was true too. If you were poor, if you were oppressed, if you were sick, surely God wasn't with you because of your, your state of affairs. You might have even been, been cursed. Maybe you were paying for, for a sin you committed. That was the mindset of Many people of the time. You can, you can make a note to look at John chapter 9. There's an account there of Jesus healing a man who was born blind. And he was asked, Lord, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? So you can see that thought was there. Because if this man or his parents would have been a good person, uh, someone that wasn't steeped in sin then the baby would have been born fine, wouldn't have been born blind, wouldn't have had any issues. Of course, Jesus' response is, no one sinned to make this man born blind. It happened because the glory of God could show through later on. Of course, then Jesus goes on and, and heals the man, but that's what the thought was there. To say poor people were blessed, Jesus, of course, again, he's, you know, he's flipping the script. He's turning everything upside down. He's the same one that you know, told people to love their enemies. Whoa, Jesus, you're, you're, it's crazy talk. We're to dislike our enemies, we're to hate them. It's eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. I'm not praying for anybody that I don't like. Jesus is, you know, he's flipping things around like he was known to do. He wants people to not just think of actions or the physical, but also the spiritual. He's the same one that equated lust with adultery and hatred with murder. But Jesus, we haven't done anything wrong physically, but yes, your hearts and your minds are, are corrupt. Jesus wants to take things from just our physical actions to our hearts and our minds too. The people that would have heard this would have been shocked at this. If Jesus was starting out a statement with blessed or fortunate, then surely he would not say the poor are fortunate. That the poor or blessed. The people may have expected Jesus to say that the rich or the healthy, the prosperous, the wise, the learned, the you know, the well to do, those with power, those high up in society would have been blessed, because again, that's what their mindset was. Something that they could do, you know, to earn God's favor. Blessed are Yes, Lord. Blessed are those that follow your laws, right? 
Because Jesus isn't always, some of us, always with the Pharisees, right? We're great. We follow the law. We look good. Our tassels are long. It's true. That's they did. They wore them extra long so people would think they're so spiritual. Be like today. Look at the 18 pound Bible I'm carrying around. I must be so great. I got the big one. I've got my 18 piece suit on and I'm carrying around the big Bible. And, you know, wow, that guy's dressed up nice and he's got a big Bible. Same difference. But yeah, same difference. But just here, of course, he isn't just talking about poor materially wise. He's again, he's wanting us to talk about, think about spiritual. He adds, of course, in spirit, but the word for poor was also fairly severe. It wasn't just someone living paycheck to paycheck, because some of us may have been there, right? Maybe we're maybe we're there now and we think, yeah, I'm 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 pretty low on the financial rung, but it was deeper than that. Not just someone that's down on their luck or living paycheck to paycheck. It's applied to a person that is a a beggar, a person of few resources, someone that had to rely on the kindness, the charity of others to make it. So when you read through scripture and you find when you come across passages that mention beggars, it was these people, those who were sitting at the gates of, of the town, hoping for someone to give them anything just so they could make it day to day. This is that word, poor. These people were considered oppressed and despised because they were just sitting there at, at the gates. Can I have something? They were looked down upon. The poor would not have been considered blessed or fortunate. But again, Jesus' teaching goes beyond the physical. It goes beyond just one issue. It takes care of all the facets of life. It's like in Acts chapter 3, some of you are familiar with this. Peter and John go to the temple at the time of prayer. And who do they meet at the gate? A beggar. And the man was hoping for money, something that would help him get through that particular day, maybe a few days. But what Peter said and what God did through him was much better. What did Peter tell him he didn't have? Okay, get going. Walking and leaping and praising God. Yep. Yeah. If you tell them, I don't have any money. I don't have silver. I don't have gold. But what I give you, I have. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. And he does. Because this man's thinking, I just need one thing. Peter gives him something so much better. The Lord working through Peter. So much better. The man was hoping for money. But far more valuable was what he was given. The greatest thing we can do is recognize that we are poor in the very next thing that Jesus is at. He doesn't say, blessed are the poor. It's the poor in spirit. But we know the meaning of the, of the word poor. It's we're, we're destitute. We're nothing. And we think spiritualized, yes, before we come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we are spiritually destitute. We have nothing. We are nothing. Of course, by adding in spirit again, Jesus points out to where their poverty lies. They're spiritually poor. We have no none of our own spiritual resources. We have to rely on the kindness of God to provide that. I can't save myself. I can't do enough works to prove to God that I'm worthy. Hey, Lord, I've done all these things. Just like as I said, we're presenting filthy rags if we're trying to earn our salvation. Without Jesus, a person remains spiritually impoverished. And if you, if you do a search on filthy rags, you'll understand what exactly we're presenting to God. It's not pleasant. Of course, spiritual poverty is easy to see when you look at the, the Romans. Road. Not too long ago, we, we had a message on on that. The first stop is in Romans 3. 
It says that all people are under the power of sin. Not one person is righteous. Not one. That, that includes me, that includes you, right? On our own, we are not righteous folk. Romans 6, the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life. I deserve punishment. I deserve death. I have sinned. Both Jesus as my Savior, I don't get that. Romans 5, Christ died for us while we were still sinners. Praise the Lord. Romans 10, if you confess Jesus, if you call on him, he saves you. All who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Then Romans 5, 1, 8, 1, and 8, 38, 39. Salvation brings us into a peaceful relationship with God. We are no longer condemned. Of course, you look at before Jesus and after Jesus are two totally different, you know, people. Once Jesus is someone's Lord and Savior, things are different. We're no longer spiritually impoverished. We're spiritually rich. We're wealthy. We have everything that God has. We're, we're children. We're adopted children. So we're given all the rights of, we have everything. Of course, this is a stark contrast again to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, who, at least in their own minds, right, and some in the community thought they were rich because of how they looked. You know, we follow the law, and we've made up so many other laws to help us follow the law. So we're good. No, sadly, they were mistaken. Jesus' words would have seemed like a slap in the face to those people whose goodness was related to their ability to, again, look good on the outside. I talk a good game. I dress a certain way. I don't do the things in public that, you know, I shouldn't do. But in private, things might be different. Inside might be different. They're the ones Jesus talked about in Matthew 23, the whitewashed tombs passage. They look good on the outside. They outwardly follow the rules, but were filthy on the inside. They were filled with hypocrisy and lawlessness. No one would want to be told that you're full of dead men's bones. I know what's inside you. Death, rottenness, disease, yuck, whatever you want, however you want to word it, right? Wouldn't be a compliment. But blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of of heaven. So those who recognize that they're spiritually impoverished turn to God, they get the kingdom. The kingdom is for the spiritually humble, not the spiritually proud. Because the spiritually proud, or even just a proud person in general, may not think that they need Jesus, do they? I don't need him. I'm a good person. We've probably heard that. We know people that say that. I'm a good person. I'm just as good as those church people. And sadly, they could be right on many occasions. Just because someone's in church, and I, church is a great place to be. It's where you hear truth. It's where you can be challenged. It's where you can be encouraged. But just because we're in church don't mean we live like we should, right? It's a good place to start. But people have a point. If I just show up for church and I don't do anything the other six days of the week... Yeah, other people that may not ever darken the door might be better than I am. But only those who humble themselves like children are granted admittance into the kingdom. You look at Matthew 18, Luke 18, Matthew 19, and Mark chapter 10 for those things. We must be like children to enter the kingdom. And we're not to hinder children from coming to Jesus, for the kingdom is, is theirs. Because again, no, again, in that Jesus again is always flipping things. Children had no, no rights. Children were looked down upon in, in that society. Go away, kids, is what the disciples are doing. Jesus said, no, don't, don't, don't hinder them. We must be like children. We must give up our, our rights to self to come to Jesus. Of course, the kingdom of heaven is everywhere that the king of heaven has authority. And where's that? 
Because one day we will live with God forever. We'll be with him on the new earth, in the new heaven. Ah, a glorious day, right? But we're his subjects and servants now. He is our king now. We don't have to wait until we pass on to love him, serve him, obey him, be with him. We can do that every day now. The kingdom is both eternity with God and knowing him today. Being poor in spirit forces us to evaluate ourselves honestly against God. His way, his will, his standards, what this book tells us how we should how we should be living, how we should be treating other people. Scripture tells us to be holy as God is holy. Peter says that in 1 Peter chapter 1. He's referring to Leviticus chapter 11. Yeah, that's what I'm going to say. So hopefully I, I wrote it down right. Leviticus 11. Be ye holy because God is holy. God has nothing to do with sin. We must, of course, we, we repent of it. We move away from it. We grow. We let the Spirit, you know, prune us of the things He needs to, you know, get rid of this, get rid of that. Anyway, over time. God is holy. He's perfect. He's just. He's love. He's wise. All the positive qualities that we should have in our life come from God. We should want to emulate Him. Of course, can we do that on our own? No, I can't say, you know what? I'm going to be great today. I'm going to do everything on my own. I can do it. You know, right? That's the pride. That's the big head. We talked about that recently in one of our evening, evening studies. We don't have to have the big head. We have to be humble. Can't think too highly of myself. I can't do it on my own. I will fall, right? We must repent, give our lives to Him first. Then we're changed. We're able to grow. We're able to serve Him. And then we're able to lead others to Him. We go from being an enemy of God to a servant of God. When I go, yeah, I am spiritually poor. I don't, I can't do it on my own. I need a Savior. I go from being an enemy of God to one of His children. We go from being on the wide road that leads to destruction to the straight and narrow that leads to heaven. We go from being like Paul. Well, we mentioned, he was mentioned earlier this morning. Paul. Paul thought he was doing right, didn't he? He thought he was doing what he was supposed to do. He persecuted believers. He rounded them up. He put them in prison. He was even there when Stephen was stoned, holding the, the cloaks of those that were the ones throwing the rocks. He approved of what they were doing. Of course, Paul, no, Paul goes from, he said, I was, you know, the chief of sinners to, you know, the great evangelist. You know, Paul's like, if God can save me, if God can use me, he can save you. So we go from being enemies of God to servants, like Paul did. Of course, they do like Paul, what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 11, 1. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. Of course, the people there in Corinth, I mean, they had their slew of issues. Reading, reading the book of Corinthians, that's a... It's a real good read. It's a real good study to dig. Is it what the people of Corinth had a lot of things that they had to remove away from that was living in a wicked town, a perverted town. So they might not have known everything. Because how do we how do we do this, Paul? How do we live right? And Paul tell them, follow my example. And that should be a goal for everybody to be able to say, right? If you don't know what to do, if you don't know how to live, do what I do. That's a steep challenge, isn't it? Do you want to know how to get to Jesus? Follow me. That's a steep, steep thing to be able to say. Of course, Paul also said in 1 Corinthians 9, 22 and 23, says, I try to find common ground with everyone, doing everything I can to save some. Or the key James words that I become all things to all people, that by some means I may save some. 
Paul's like, when I was with the Gentiles, I lived like the Gentiles. When I was with the Jewish people, I lived like the Jewish people. He made inroads where he can with who he could to lead somebody to the Lord. Because we know Paul faced opposition and persecution most places he went. But he was also productive too. So do what we can to lead somebody to the Lord. We are truly blessed if we have been saved. Amen. If we're saved, we are truly blessed people. We should want to see others saved as well, do we not? Someone told me the good news. You can go from being condemned and heading to hell to redeemed and heading to heaven. The most loving thing we can do is share the gospel. We should live our lives in such a way that people want to know our Jesus. People are watching us whether we think they are or not, whether we want them to or not. People watch what we do, what we say, maybe even what we don't do. People, some of people may even do something, ask you something just to see how you'll respond. And if they follow our example, they'll know how to find him, love him, and serve him. Am I living in such a way to where someone could know Jesus just by what I say and do? Yeah, last thing. Christianity is not just about where you go when you die. Though it's a big thing. If Jesus is my Lord and Savior, I know where I'm spending eternity. I'm not worried about it. I, don't, I love it when, when, when Jeff says this. If I am here, God is with me. But if I'm not here, who am I with? I went either way, right? And it's true. Christianity is more than just where I go when I die. It's about everything you do while you're alive and why you do what you do when you're alive. You are blessed if you know God. You can love Him, obey Him, serve Him, and live each day to lead others to Him. That's why we're here, to lead others to the Lord. You have recognized your spiritual poverty and change if we went from an enemy of God to a servant of God, from someone that's fighting against him to one of his children. You are blessed, and you need to, to recognize that. Yes, I am blessed. Maybe one of these weeks we'll, we'll sing, Count Your Blessings, because it, it'll fit in into this series. But the kingdom is yours. So think about that. I am blessed because I am God's. And nobody can take me away from 